Okay, folks. Well, I'm going to. Um, you've had your chance to chat now, so I'm just going to reserve your uh, your chat for the time being. That if you need to send uh, uh, me a message, then you can do that. All right. All right. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, it's, this is the uh, if you're you know you're in the right spot. This is the Veritas lecture with Dr. Phyllis Lagano. As we uh, begin this evening, I uh, want to acknowledge that King's University College is located in close proximity to three vibrant local First Nations communities who have long-standing relationships with the land and place that we now recognize as London, Ontario, Chippewa of the Thames First Nation, Oneida Nation of the Thames and the Muncie Delaware Nation. Historically, the Attawandaram peoples also once settled this region alongside the Algonquin and the Haudenosaunee peoples and used this land as their traditional beaver hunting grounds. Uh, today, a diverse and a growing indigenous population live in London and the surrounding areas. We are all treaty people along with all the responsibilities and the duties that that entails. And so it's important tonight that we remember that we share this land, we share in the responsibility to care for this place that we inhabit for a time, and we share the task of sustaining respectful and meaningful relationships with those around us, particularly with those who suffer from un unjust structures. Miigwech, thank you. For those who don't know me, my name is Jim Pancho. I'm the uh, Director of Campus Ministry here at King's University College. And I'm uh, also the coordinator uh, of this Veritas lecture series. So this year, um, because we're still limited uh, by a global pandemic, um, we are forced to come together in this uh, online fashion. It's always much better when we're able to do things in person. Um, but we do have this opportunity and uh, it's a wonderful opportunity. Um, I think we have uh, close to about 100 people here this evening. And uh, so just by way of process, as we get started, um, we're using this webinar format, which makes it hard to interact with each other, um, but it does give us a better uh, lecture presentation quality. So uh, Dr. Zagano has agreed to, for us to record this lecture. It will be available later on our website. Um, so the downside is that our speaker can't see you and uh, respond to the way you're reacting. And the uh, question and answer time is a little bit uh, less free flowing. Um, but I would ask you just to take note of the Q&A button on your screen um, and use that anytime during the lecture if you want to pose questions. Um, I will gather uh, any questions that are, are put in there and uh, um, present them to Dr. Zagano uh, during the question and answer time at the end of the lecture. So just a little bit about the Veritas lecture series that uh, in this series, we try to engage speakers from a variety of backgrounds so that we can really explore the depth of the human experience. And we try to articulate different truths and the fullness of humanity to which we aspire. The Catholic intellectual tradition welcomes and embraces this exploration as a participation in the common good that enhances the world that we inhabit. Our theme this year is Seeds of Hope, and it, it acknowledges that new life and opportunity often follow times of adversity. By trusting in this wisdom that lies embedded within our community, we can collectively find a way forward into a future full of hope. Now, it's indeed my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Phyllis Zagano. Um, Dr. Zagano is an internationally acclaimed Catholic scholar who has lectured throughout the United States and Canada, in Europe and in Australia. Her many awards include the 2014 Isaac Hecker Award for Social Justice from the Paulist Center community in Boston uh, for her prolific body of work that has constantly echoed the cry of the poorest of our society for dignity and for justice, both inside and outside the church, specifically the dignity of all women. Her groundbreaking work on women in the diaconate led, her to, led to her appointment uh, to the Pontifical Commission for the Study of the Diaconate of Women in 2016. 
Dr. Zagano has taught at Fordham, Fordham in Boston and Yale universities and currently holds a research appointment at Hofstra University, Hampstead, New York. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Phyllis Zagano who will present Catholic Women, Catholic Church, where do we go from here? Thank you. Thank you, thank you Jim. You know, um, the theme of uh, this year's Veritas lecture is Seeds of Hope, as you said. It acknowledges the fact that new life and opportunity also follow times of adversity. The theme, and apparently Pope Francis, trust in the wisdom that lies embedded within the community. And I think we can together find a way forward into a future of hope. However, many Catholic women who are the mainstays of uh, Catholic pastoral ministry are increasingly frustrated by the church's response to requests for increased presence in the church, for increased inclusion in pastoral ministry, for increased participation in decision-making. How has the church responded to their requests, to their repeated requests for increased recognition of women as icons of Christ and thereby appropriate persons to work as professionals in stable offices in the church? I think, um, I think I dropped a paper. <laughs> the, um, let me say at the start, there's, there's no doctrinal teaching against the ordination of women as deacons. There's what we call a merely ecclesiastical law that can be amended if the church ever responds to some 50 or 60 years of requests to restore women to the diaconate. But now we have the synod. We have more than one synod. We have synods in every parish, in every diocese, in every country, on every continent in the world, or at least we're supposed to have them. Somehow, 1.2 billion Catholics are going to have their say, not, not about what the church is, but about how it is. Not, not so much about what the church teaches, but about how it teaches. And very importantly, about who does the teaching. But, but to begin with, the question many women have is about synodality. The, the process is supposed to be about encountering, listening, and discerning. We know that women want to speak, to have their say. Women have many questions and women have many answers about the way the church is and the way the church can be. But, but who's doing the listening? The synodal process itself is ambitious and exciting. Every diocese is supposed to organize a method by which every parish will somehow call together its members to talk about their pressing questions. The synod officially opened in Rome the weekend of October 9, 10, and every diocese in the world was supposed to open its synodal process on October 17th. Last May, Five months before the official opening weekends, Maltese Cardinal Mario Grec, the Secretary General of the Synod of Bishops in Rome, wrote every bishop in the world and asked him for the name or names of the person or persons responsible for their local diocesan synod. So, so what happened? The Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops has no detailed information about the synod in Canada and did not have the names of individuals managing diocesan processes. The conference's general secretary told me that there will be a diocesan processes and at least two regional reports, one in English and one in French. Some Canadian bishops went up to Rome for the opening weekend, but there's nothing on the CCCB website. As of yesterday, the US Conference of Catholic Bishops says that only 80 of 196 particular churches, that is the various US dioceses and eparchies, have named contacts. Just a few days ago on October 18th, America Magazine reported that, quote, despite Vatican instructions to reach out to women, the handicapped, refugees, migrants, the elderly, people who live in poverty, and Catholics who rarely or never practice their faith, only a handful describe plans to specifically reach out to those groups. The USCCB, the US Conference of Catholic Bishops, does have a website and the conference has hired a PhD student as a part-time consultant to manage their part in the Senate process. Together, 
the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops and the US Conference of Catholic Bishops are to gather and collate the diocesan responses, which in turn will be summaries of the parish responses. And together, the two conferences, the USCCB and the CCCB, will together write a joint 10-page paper to forward to Rome. Now, a few countries, Germany and Ireland, for example, and some Latin American, some in Latin America and the Caribbean, as well as a few US dioceses, you know, San Diego comes to mind, began the process some time ago. Australia has just uh, finished the first phase of its plenary council meetings, and a second week long meeting will be held next April. But the, the point of synodality is for us, all of us, as I said earlier, is to encounter, to listen, and to discern. But but who's encountering whom? Who is listening to whom? Who is discerning what? So the question, synodality and women. Women want to know that they're heard. Are women being encountered in the process? Are women being listened to? When women discern their paths, is there any action? Most importantly, what are the issues most pressing for women? Without question, the problem is about how women are treated. The scourge of clericalism infects every corner of the church. It's not just clerics who are clerical. Men and women alike who are involved in church can become part of the sixth system of clericalism. That aside, to be sure, there are at least three issues prominent in the minds of women as they approach, or at least as they view, the synodal process. Clericalism, sex abuse crisis, and the question of ordination. Now, clericalism. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary has a helpful definition. Clericalism is, and I quote, the policy of maintaining or increasing the power of religious hierarchy. In 1520, Martin Luther decried clericalism and said it was the result of canon law. Uh, what Luther wrote was, yea, the priests and the monks are deadly enemies, wrangling about their self-conceived ways and methods like fools and madmen, not only to hindrance, but to the very destruction of Christian love and unity. Each one clings to his sect and despises the others, and they regard the laymen as though they were not Christians. This lamentable condition is only a result of law. The sex abuse crisis. We've heard enough, uh, we've, we've heard too much. The, the worldwide sex abuse crisis is not over because news reports about it reverberate across the internet and other media. And then they are stuck in our minds and in our hearts. There's a pervasive belief, especially among women, that young people and children are not safe near priests. The horrors of the past, whether five or 50 or more years ago, are compressed in the public mind into one colossal event. In the United States, this is further complicated by the fact that the 2002 so-called Dallas Charter about clerical sex abuse specifically eliminated bishops. That fact alone undermined the public trust in bishops in general and the drip, 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 of lawsuits and reports around the world continues to erode confidence in the episcopate. And then there's ordination. Women are still asking about ordination. There, there are two distinct requests, the priesthood and the diaconate. The priesthood has been definitively ruled out. If there is to be any discussion about women in priesthood, it can be about the level of the teaching, but not about the teaching itself. That is, the question that can be considered is whether the ban on women priests is an irreformable teaching, unable to be changed because it is a final doctrinal statement. However, there's no doctrinal statement against women deacons. So when we talk about synodality and women and the diaconate, my, as you know, my academic research is about women and the diaconate and my work is focused on the past on the present and on the future. In the past, who were the women deacons of history? What'd they do? How were they appointed? What, what, what are the documented historical findings? And the present, what is the diaconate today and who are today's women deacons? What is their calling? 
How did the diaconate come to be restored? Can, can today's women deacons be recognized? And in the future, can women be ordained as deacons? Who, who will be the women deacons of the future? Will they be women religious? Will they be married women? Will they be single women? What will they do? Will they be accepted? These are serious questions and they're real. Women deacons are a fact of our church's history for more than 1,000 years. Can we get over the speed bump of the past 800 years to a new and revitalized church that accepts ordained women deacons? Now the 2019 Amazon Synod asked for increased roles for women. As I said, during the weekend of October 9-10, Pope Francis opened the current Synod on Synodality and the Synod process. On Sunday, October 17th, as I said, every diocese in the world was invited to open its diocesan synodal process, which will come culminate with Episcopal conferences collecting diocesan input this coming spring. The response will then be forwarded in 10 pages uh, by, each, uh, by each continent to Rome, where the Synod office will create a working document to share with the bishops and others who will attend the full meeting of the Synod on Synodality now scheduled for October, 2023 in Rome. However, at least four commissions have studied women deacons over the past 50 years. Two sub-commissions of the International Theological Commission, one from 1992 to 1997, another from 1997 to 2002, plus now two pontifical commissions, one from 2016 and a new one named in 2020 that began work in 2021, have all talked about women in the diaconate. Will the talking ever end? To begin with, what did all those commissions talk about? I, I can't speak specifically and directly to my own commission, but there is some of the there's, there's here's some of the evidence for women in the diaconate. In Romans 16, chapters one to two, which we again just skipped over in the lectionary, St. Phoebe is the only person in scripture called deacon. That is, she's the only person with the actual job title, if you will, of deacon. I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who is also a minister of the church at St. Crea. Now, I've given you the USCCB official translation but diakonos is the word that's used. They translate diakonos as minister, whereas the more accurate translation is deacon. This passage, Romans 16, one to two, is not in the lectionary, as I said, despite widespread devotion to her cult. St. Phoebe is understood to have carried St. Paul's letter to the Romans. There's great devotion and growing devotion to St. Phoebe. There's a group called Discerning Deacons that holds an annual St. Phoebe Day event online every September 3rd. I, I, I have on the bottom slide here on the right, uh, the St. Phoebe cards that are made uh, recently by a manufacturer in I think Pittsburgh called Cards by Ann. Anyway, then we have 1 Timothy 3, 3 to 11 and the women also. The scripture passage in which the requirements for a deacon are outlined for both male and female deacons. And I'll read it. Similarly, deacons must be dignified, not deceitful, not addicted to drink, not greedy for sordid gain, holding fast to the ministry of the faith with a clear conscience. Moreover, they should be tested first. Then if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. Women similarly, should be dignified, not slanderers, but temperate and faithful in everything. Deacons may be married only once <clears throat> and must manage their children and their households well. Thus, those who serve well as deacons gain good standing and much confidence in their faith in Christ Jesus. Well, <clears throat> here is the US Conference of Catholic Bishops footnote to 1 Timothy 3 to 11. Women. This seems to refer to women deacons, but may possibly mean wives of deacons. The former is preferred because the word is used absolutely. If deacons' wives were meant, a possessive there would be expected. Moreover, the footnote continues, they are also introduced by the word similarly, as in 1 Timothy 3.8. This parallel suggests that they are two exercised 
ecclesial functions. Now, the history of, of women in the diaconate is, is long and, and we don't have time here to go through it. I can tell you that women continue to be ordained as deacons in the medieval and early modern church and actually are known up to the 12th century in the East and in the West. How do we know that? Quite simply, there are various local councils, mainly in Europe that decry and in some cases actually outlaw the practice. The reasons? In general, women are found unfit for altar service, unfit to be near the sacred because they are unclean and stupid. So the practice of ordaining women as deacons is gradually outlawed by Western medieval councils. But we know that women were ordained in the West up to the 12th century because we have evidence that, for example, Bishop Ottoni and Luca in Northern Italy ordained women deacons for his diocese. But do remember, the fact that ordaining women as deacons was outlawed from place to place actually documents the fact that ordained women deacons were a continued and constant tradition in the West. We also have evidence from the Maronite church, an Eastern church that never broke from Rome. The Maronite Holy City Synod of Mount Lebanon in 1736 was called to rectify Maronite and Latin liturgical practices. The canons resulting from that synod were brought to Rome by Lebanese Archbishop Joseph Simon Azamani, who was also a librarian of Vatican Library. At least two canons were approved in forma specifica by the Pope at the time. One canon allowed bishops to ordain women as deacons, and a second canon lists the tasks and duties of these women deacons. So there are two laws in the approved canons of an Eastern Catholic church that never broke ties with Rome. Two laws that allow bishops to ordain women as deacons for their diocese and actually specify what they are to do. Meanwhile, many of the Orthodox churches, those Eastern churches not in communion with Rome, continued or in some cases have reinstated the tradition of ordaining women as deacons. There are two groups in the United States pressing for a wider restoration of women to the ordained diaconate in orthodoxy. One is the St. Phoebe Center and another, a smaller effort entitled St. Catherine's Vision. Let's talk a little bit about the Orthodox churches. We can digress just a minute and move to briefly examine the work and tradition of our older cousins, the Orthodox churches. I, I think it's extremely important to note that the Orthodox churches continued or, rein to, or reinstated the tradition. For example, <clears throat> 1988, the Pan-Orthodox consultation held in Rhodes, Greece, called for the revival of the Order of Women Deacons. In 2004, the Synod of the Sui Generis Church of Greece voted to restore women to the diaconate. And in 2017, as you can see in the picture, the Patriarchate of Alexandria, that is of Alexandria and all of Africa, ordained five women as deacons in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Now this last ordination as pictured here is contested by conservatives and argued to be one only to the subdiaconate, but perhaps those so arguing forget that the subdiaconate was and is still a major order. Now, in the contemporary discussion, it is suspected that in the 1980s, as plans for restoring the diaconate as a, in the 1970s, as plans for restoring the diaconate as a permanent office and vocation in the church were underway, Pope Paul VI asked a member of the International Theological Commission, Kamaldolese Benedictine monk and expert on Eastern liturgy, Cipriano Baggini, <clears throat> about women deacons. I was told by another Eastern liturgical expert, Robert Taft of the Society of Jesus, that the paper Vagagini produced was completed in 1972, but that it never became an official paper of the International Theological Commission. Therefore, Taft, at the same time, at the time, the editor of the Rome-based academic journal or Orientalia Christiana Periodica, published the paper in Italian in 1974. But the fight was already on. Shortly before the Vagagini paper appeared in Italian, in 1972, the Belgian professor Roger Grison, writing in French, found positively for women deacons. 
basing his argument on historical ordinations. He wrote that women deacons were truly ordained. Monsignor Philippe Delay, Secretary of the International Theological Commission from 1972 to 1989 agreed, as did, as I said, Cipriano Bagagini two years later. <clears throat> Soon, however, the French professor, Amy Georges Marimart, argued negatively and published a counter study in 1982, which, however, concluded that no definitive answer could come from history because the evidence was incomplete. As it happened, activism and scholarship turned to the women priest debate. Even so, in 1992, the International Theological Commission, which is an international group of 30 male theologians, connected to the, it's connected to the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. The International Theological Commission, the ITC as it's called, began work in subcommittee on the question of women deacons. <clears throat> By 1997, that subcommittee presented a 17 page positive report to the prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, who was the ex officio president of the International Theological Commission. However, the prefect refused to sign it. The prefect who refused to promulgate that report was Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger. What happened next? Well, another subcommission of the International Theological Commission still under the presidency of Cardinal Ratzinger. This new all-male subcommission was headed by a former student of Cardinal Ratzinger. It, it eventually, by 2002, produced a much longer, uh, about 78 pages report. One of the subcommission uh, members was Gerhard Mueller, who seems to have rewritten the relatively small section on women deacons uh, from the older report. Computer comparisons in German found 18 plagiarized sections of this new report, all in the section on women deacons. That is, the plagiarized and in some cases paraphrased sections came directly from a previously published book by commission member Gerhard Mueller, who was made Bishop of Regensburg nearly immediately after the 2002 document appeared. Be that as it may, there were essentially three findings in the 2002 report, now entitled From the Diaconia of Christ to the Diaconia of the Apostles. First, women and male deacons had different tasks and duties, and there were some differences in the appointment ceremonies. Second, it is a magisterial and conciliar teaching that the diaconate is not the priesthood. Therefore, the question of women deacons is up to the ministry of discernment, that the Lord has left his church to decide. Now, there are two major problems with the conclusion that the diaconate should and would be left to the ministry of discernment that the Lord had left his church to decide. First of all, the Pope at the time in 2002 was John Paul II. He was not particularly interested in women or in synodality. Second, John Paul's successor was Benedict XVI. The same Joseph Ratzinger who refused to sign the positive 1997 report on women deacons and who stacked the second all male subcommission with men who would make sure things turned out right. However, neither Joan Paul nor Benedict XVI particularly interested in synodality or in women. So the re recommendation that the Ministry of Discernment take up the question whether that meant the Pope would decide that the newly recovered church practice of synodality should be applied, languished. But in 2013, the world awoke to news that a new Pope would be taking up residence. Benedict was, was resigning. And uh, another strong Cardinal, this one from Argentina, would move into the Papal Palace, except that he didn't. The Jesuit Cardinal Archbishop of Buenos Aires, Argentina, appeared on the balcony and asked for the people's blessing. He took the name Francis, and things have not been the same since. Now, every three years or so, the International Union of Superiors General, the organization of some 1,500 heads of women religious orders and institutes from around the world, meets in Rome. For their second triennial meeting with Pope Francis in May of 2016, the group, it's known as the UISG, asked to be able to ask questions 
of the Pope rather than have him present a prepared address as he had three years earlier. The Pope said yes. So the UISG quickly asked its constellations, its, its groupings around the world for suggested questions. They summarized the, resp the responses uh, that, that headquarters received into six questions. Two involve women deacons. Okay. Women religious in many parts of the world already worked as deacons, they said, so why not ordain them? In fact, why not have a commission to study the question? So the UISG was asked for the names of eight nominees to be hand delivered to Casa Santa Marta. Three of the eight nominees, I lost a slide here somewhere. Three of the eight nominees um, were Sister Mary Maloney, who's on the bottom right, Sister Nuria Calder-Banaj, a missionary daughter of the Holy Family of Nazareth on the upper right, and me. I don't know about the others. I was not asked. I simply found my name at the bottom of a 12 page of 12 names uh, listed in an Italian press release published by the Sala Stampa, the Vatican press office. Now, here are pictures of the commissioners. I won't read all their names, uh, but it's, it's pretty much, oh, I will read all their names. They're, it's really a mixed bag of individuals. The chair or the president of the commission on the bottom left is Cardinal Louis Ladaria, who was Cardinal Mueller's second in command at the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith and who then became prefect when Cardinal Mueller's five-year term expired. In addition to Sister Nuria Caldock Benage, Sister Mary Malone and me, the persons named as commissioners were uh, Dr. France, uh, Francesca Cochini, who's on the upper left, uh, who's an ordinary professor of the history of Christianity at Sapienza or University in Rome, and also lecturer in patristics at the Augustinian Patristic Institute in Rome. Uh, Monsignor uh, Coda, Piero Coda, an ordinary professor of systematic theology at Sofia University, Florence, and a member of the International Theological Commission uh, in the middle row on the right. Father uh, Robert Dodero, who at the time was president and professor of the Augustinian Pro uh, Patristic Institute in the upper right. Uh, Santiago Madrigal Terrazas, a professor of, at Camillus Pontifical University in, in uh, Madrid in the middle row, in the middle of the middle row. Hein Karl Heinz Menke, an emer emeritus professor of dramatic theology at the University of Bonn, Germany and a member of the International Theological Commission. He was awarded the Ratzinger Prize in 2017. Father Amigo Muzoni uh, of Rwanda, uh, an ecclesiology professor at the Pontifical Salesian University and a consultant to several Vatican dicasteries, including the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. He's in the middle on the bottom. Father Bernard Poitier, a Jesuit, Belgian Jesuit, a professor of dogmatic theology and philosophy at the Institute of Theological Studies, which is now the Forum Saint-Michel in Brussels, and also a member of the International Theological Commission on the bottom right. Uh, on the bottom left, uh, Dr. Mariana Schlosser, Professor of Spiritual Theology at the University of Vienna in Austria, and a member of the International Theological Commission. She received the Ratzinger Prize in 2018. Uh, Dr. Michalina Tenace in the middle top, uh, a member of Centro Alete, a secular institute, an ordinary professor and director of the Department of Fundamental Theology at the Pontifical Gregorian University, and a consultor to the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. <clears throat> Our commission, myself, Sister Nuria, and Sister Mary Malone, met four times in Rome in the offices of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, each time for one and a half days between November, 2016 and June, 2018. I actually had uh, Thanksgiving dinner 2016 in Casa Santa Marta, the, the home of the Holy Father. And I had it with an American Nobel Prize winner. So uh, interesting people you meet there. At the triennial meeting of the International Union of Superiors General in May, 2019, the Holy Father gave what he termed a portion of the report we prepared to the UISG president, Sister Carmen Samut, and said she could do with it what she wished. In January of 2020, the new president, Sister Yolanta Kafka, disclosed that the portion she received was about history. 
Now, the Amazon Synod in 2019 had asked for women to be formally installed in the lay ministries of lector and acolyte. It also asked for the question of women deacons to be sent back to my commission. The Holy Father said he heard what they said, and I'm told nine of the 12 language groups endorsed or requested women deacons at the Amazon Synod. And that the Holy Father said he would recall the commission and perhaps add one or two persons to it. But he didn't. Uh, neither I nor any commissioner heard anything until April 2020, when it appeared that a completely new commission would be constituted, five men and five women, with Father Dennis dupont fauville on the right uh, of the CDF, the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, a Parisian priest, as secretary, and Cardinal Giuseppe Petrocchi on the left, the Archbishop of Aquila in Italy, as its president. Uh, here's a listing of the names of the individuals. They're not very well known. Many of them are more interested in pastoral ministry than in theology. Um, some of them have uh, written negatively about me and about my work. Uh, and on the right, there's a, a, a picture of the very imposing building, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. So the question, women deacons, well, what are the questions? Were women sacramentally ordained? And can women be sacramentally ordained? Now, were women sacramentally ordained? Ancient and medieval liturgies document that women were ordained as deacons. They were ordained by their bishops within the sanctuary, during the mass, in the presence of the clergy, through the imposition of hands, by the invocation of the Holy Spirit. They self-communicated from the chalice. The bishop placed a stole around the necks and these women were called deacons. But, but can women be sacramentally ordained? These are the points for discussion. Deacons minister in the diaconia of the word, the liturgy and charity to the people of God. What among diaconal function can a woman not prefer, perform? Since the diaconate is an ordained ministry and the deacon is termed to serve in persona Christi, that is in the person of Christ the servant, it has been argued that women cannot image Christ. Now, there are two problems here. First, before the 2002 ITC documents, deacons were termed to serve in nomine ecclesia in the name of the church. And secondly, it's heretical to say any human being is not made in the image and likeness of God. It's heretical to say any, any human being cannot image Christ. Third, the diaconate is a permanent vocation. Following the Second Vatican Council, the church restored the diaconate as a permanent vocation, noting that men already functioned as deacons, and thus it's only right, this is a quote from Lumen Gentium, it's only right to strengthen them by the imposition of hands that they may carry out their ministry more effectively because of the sacramental grace of the diaconate. Now, if the diaconate is a permanent vocation, even given that priest candidates are still first ordained as what are termed transitional deacons, then there should be no argument against restoring women to the diaconate as a permanent ordained office. In any event, the diaconate is not the priesthood. See, the, the cursus honorum, the course of honor that developed during the Middle Ages was actually suppressed by Pope Paul VI in 1972 with an apostolic letter, which he did on his own authority, motu proprio, called Ministeria Quedam. The four minor orders, lector, porter, exorcist, and acolyte, and the major order of subdeacon were suppressed and replaced by the two installed lay ministries of lector and acolyte, into which Pope Francis recently allowed women, which he announced through a letter to the prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, Cardinal Ladaria dated January 10th, 2021, which actually this year was the feast of the baptism of the Lord. All the Pope did was eliminate one word in Canon 230 paragraph one of the Code of Canon Law, which now states, and I quote, lay persons who possess the age and qualifications established by decree of the Conference of Bishops can be admitted on a stable basis through the prescribed liturgical rite to the ministries of lector and acolyte. The change, the law since 18, 1983 read uh, laymen. 
Now, the replacement of the four minor orders and the major order of subdeacon with the two installed ministries to which women may be appointed is important. Please note, women may now serve in ministries that were once four minor and one major order. Also, women may now be formally installed in ministries that candidates for the diaconate must serve in prior to ordination. Now, lay ministry is not ordained ministry, nor should it be. But unless women could be installed as lectors and acolytes, there would be no way they could be ordained as deacons. And so we return to the synod. What is the promise? What is the hope? The process will be messy, but it will, at least it should be fun. We're all in this together and we have or should have the chance to be listened to. If your diocese and your parish are participating, that's great. If not, find a group, send your thoughts directly to Rome. We belong to many, many concentric circles of relationships. The parish is one way to reach out for your thoughts, but there are many other groups that can have a voice from professional associations to prison blocks, to interest groups, to clubs and schools. The point is to encounter, to listen and discern. I sometimes think the Holy Father intends to lead the entire church on a two year long Ignatian retreat. Where do we go? Most importantly, to whom shall we go? We shall go to Jesus Christ. That's the method and that's the process and that is the goal. We must encounter and listen to Christ in our lives and in our hearts and thereby discern the way forward. No matter what, no matter how, Fasten your seatbelts, come along and enjoy the ride. Wow. Thank you, uh, Dr. Zagano. That was a wonderful lecture. So, so um, we're just gonna open up now for some questions and, uh, and answers. I, um, so um, right now I see no, no questions in our Q&A uh, form, so please, uh, find that spot on your uh, on your screen and uh, it's time to have a, an exchange of ideas. Um, all right. maybe maybe it'd be easier for folks to put them in the chat function. So I've opened the chat as well. So there we go. Okay. So there. Um, um, so uh, Dr. Mark Jensen, who's a um, professor here at King's, um, asks, "Do you think it's possible <clears throat> to reimagine the College of Cardinals more inclusively?" Well, if by that you mean to have uh, married men and women as cardinals, I uh, the the last lay cardinal died at the at the end of the 19th century. Uh, there, there were two actually. Uh, they were named as cardinals and I think then were ordained as deacons. Um, I think it's more likely to have clerical cardinals. You know, the, the cardinal is simply a, an advisor to the Pope. It's not really related to clerical orders. Uh, the current law is that one must be at least a priest in order to be a cardinal and that on being named cardinal or the term is elevated to the College of Cardinals, uh, one must accept Episcopal, cardinal, uh, Episcopal orders. We just had an example of someone um, who, who was, um, was named to an office that is a cardinalate office, but he asked not to uh, be named a bishop. Um, and typically in the past, say, 50, 100 years or so, uh, there has been a practice of naming as cardinals uh, individuals who are markedly special by their academic or other achievements. Um, they're over 80 and they can decline being, um, being ordained as bishops. Uh, uh, but typically, uh, now in the College of Cardinals, there are cardinal deacons, cardinal priests and cardinal bishops. The genesis of the College of Cardinals was to select from basically among the deacons and priests of Rome, uh, specific individuals who would be uh, 
uh, would be advisors to the Pope. Um, the the cardinal the cardinal deacon is a rank of of the cardinal college of cardinals. So if you had women deacons or even married men as de deacons, uh, I, I they could uh, theoretically I would say become uh, cardinal deacons. Uh, the the uh, um, it's it, the pope can can do what he wishes. The other way, uh, it's not exactly reimagining as, as the professor suggests, but um, some cardinals are named in pectore or in the heart and no one knows who they are. This, this has happened uh, under where people are under communist rule. And there are always rumors that um, this or that woman was named a cardinal and then the Pope who named her died. And uh, so her cardinalate her, her went away, you know, it never became public. So. I, th I think it would be easier to have women as cardinals um, if they were ordained as deacons. Uh, I see no reason to have um, a deacon named as cardinal. We, we have uh, plenty of uh, uh, examples of that in history, um, but we also have lay cardinals in history. Uh, so uh, it, that, that would be fun. In any event, and I get this question asked a lot. The first time I was asked was on uh, Salt and Light Television maybe 10 years ago. Um, if there is a woman cardinal, uh, she'll be the last in line, uh, you know, uh, in the voting line. But it would be very interesting to have a woman there in, uh, in the conclave to, uh, uh, to help elect uh, the next pope. I, I think that would be, uh, that'd be fun. I don't think she'd be eligible, but uh, it would be fun to, to have her there. So a couple of questions have come in uh, during that answer. Um, I'm going to start with... Um, Father Matthew George said that you said that the Maronite Council proceedings were recognized by Rome, but what was the role of women deacons that they put forward? Well, they weren't putting anything forward. Well, the the canons, um, you know, I, I have a whole paper I can send you on the topic. Um, the the job of the woman deacon was pretty much as we we know it today to assist with baptisms, to minister to um, to ill women. Um, th there doesn't seem to be any prohibition against uh, women deacons participating in liturgy at the time. Um, I actually have never been able to uncover the, uh, uh, the formula, the, the ordination ceremony for Maronite women deacons, but whenever I talk to a Maronite uh, cleric, a priest, or, or bishop, they're like, oh yeah, no, no big deal. We had, we had women deacons. Were they really ordained, Father? Yes, of course they were really ordained. What do you mean? Well, because they would carry the sacrament, because they perform sacramental duties, even, even only carrying the Eucharist to, to ill women, they had to be ordained to perform the sacred. The, the implication was that, that uh, the women were also anointing ill women. Uh, and, and we do have evidence in, in history in the West actually of, uh, of women deacons sacramentally anointing uh, ill women. And we know that, that uh, it's, not, it's not disputed that in, the early church, the ancient church, women deacons uh, anointed and <clears throat> participated in anointing of uh, bap baptismal anointing and chrismation um, in, in, the, in, the early, in the early church. So um, I, I, I've asked this a couple of times of Maronite uh, bishops and they're like, of course, they, of course, of course they were ordained. Of course they were ordained. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> oh, shoot. Um, okay, sorry, I just um, mixed something up, but that's okay, I'll fix it in a second. Um, Sister uh, Pat McKeon uh, asks, um, please, actually, it's good, yeah, please expand on your suggestion of forming groups discussing the issue of women deacons and sending questions directly to Rome, or at least raising the questions in other church leadership organizations. It's funny, we were talking a little bit about that when we got started, it's just what's happening with the Synod right here, but um, if you could expand on, on that well, idea. Well, Sister Pat, here's the deal. Um, there, there are two issues here. One, if you want to participate in the Synod and your parish is not working, or you don't want to participate in your parish synodal process, you're perfectly free, according to the instructions from Rome, um, <clears throat> to find another group and to prepare your own documentation, your own, your own discussion. The, the synodal process, however, is not supposed to be about pushing one thing or another. It's rather to gather and talk about the needs of the church. Now, if, 
in your discussion group, whether it's, and, and I know in the United States, groups of women religious, the Vickers for Religious are, uh, have been sending out to, uh, to the religious in their diocese, at least in the Archdiocese of Philadelphia, um, to gather the women religious as a group if they wish to discuss um, the needs of the church uh, that they would, would then prepare a paper to send to Rome. If the diaconate comes up, <clears throat> Well, then fine, the diaconate comes up. I've actually written a book called Women Religious, Women Deacons, which um, kind of analyzes the questions that would come up in a group of women religious specifically who uh, are, are considering either admitting, say, say in 10 years, um, there are women, lay women, uh, who become clerics, secular women who are ordained and then want to enter a religious institute. You know, I, I, this book that I've done discusses those questions about asking, uh, inviting people who are already ordained into a um, uh, lay institute, basically, uh, of women religious. Uh, or what happens if a woman who is already professed in an institute wishes to uh, be ordained? You know, what, what are the implications there? And then this book, which in my lifetime, I hope Paulus Press will publish, um, they, uh, we, we give questions and answers to, uh, to these, not questions. I mean, the answers come from the sisters who discuss, but it's, it's a short booklet, really 70 pages, 70 or 80 pages <clears throat> to guide sisters and to give in, information uh, uh, about, uh, about the question of women religious, women deacons. You know, the, the one I get all the time is uh, from women religious, I, uh, and particularly from general superiors, well, I don't want some bishop ordering my sisters to go X, Y, or Z. I said, so, well, they can't. You know, um, the 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 woman religious professed in an order is missioned by her institute, and um, now I, I kind of give the the example ordination in this case, as with uh, other religious clerics, uh, with Jesuit priests, Franciscan priests. Ordination is, is a license. Uh, it becomes, it becomes a, a qualification, but then one still needs a license and the license is, is termed as faculties. So the woman religious in London, Ontario, uh, who has been ordained by the Bishop of London, Ontario, but whose order or institute wishes to mission her to Quebec, um, the order could mission her to Quebec but it would be the Archbishop of Quebec who would grant her faculties. Does, I hope that makes any sense. I, I think of it this way. Suppose you're a physician uh, in the United States, in, in Michigan, and you now want to set up shop in London, Ontario. You, you have to get another license, another medical license. Uh, but uh, in terms specifically of women religious and missioning, it is the general superior who does the missioning for a religious and uh, uh, it's kind of, it's kind of, in some cases, I, I kind of lean toward women religious being ordained as deacons rather than um, secular women, uh, because there's a protection in the religious institute um, uh, for for the woman religious. Uh, the, the 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 secular uh, secular woman would really be dependent upon the bishop, uh, and perhaps for for you know ministerial employment. Um, uh, but men deacons, you know, deal with this all the time. They know, they know better than I um, or we uh, how 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 it could work out. Anyway, um, as I said, in my lifetime, this book will come out. I heard from the editor of Paul's Press today, so um, <clears throat> maybe in a couple of months, I'll be able to tell you more. Yeah, I'm going to combine a couple of questions because it's around the same uh, theme. So, and it has to do with like who's who's really a against this idea who's threatened by this change and um you know part of it is that it seems like there's roadblocking and bureaucracy that that seems to be rooted in a fear of change is what what changes are people afraid of if that's maybe a lot to put together but, well you know i don't know there's what changes uh i i, I think there are, there are a couple of things i i just heard someone had dinner with someone from the uh, department of state in rome and said, well, you know, the Department of State is, uh, 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 this fellow is, is convinced they don't really want to be deacons, they really want to be priests. 
So there's the fear that um, this is somehow uh, the term I've heard is the camel's nose under the tent. Uh, but people who say that either don't believe church teaching or don't understand the conciliar teaching that the diaconate is not the priesthood and that there is a permanent vocation, which is, which is the diaconate. Uh, I think there are a lot of malformed clerics in the world, I'm sure this is not a surprise, um, who cannot deal with women, period. And so they are threatened. There's also the lingering um, inherited uh, taboos about women being dirty and unclean. I mean, the Council of Paris in, I think, 18, 829 uh, talks about um, women being stupid um, and untrustworthy. I mean, horrible stuff that, that's said about women. And this lingers and this, this perdures in different cultures. If you remember the cartoon I showed at the beginning, you know, there are only two groups really that eliminate women from leadership. One is the Catholic Church and the other is the Taliban. And, and, and there are, are ways to, uh, uh, in different cultures, ways to uh, appreciate uh, that sometimes it's education, sometimes it's culture, sometimes it's ignorance, um, and, and a combination of these, these, uh, these factors around the world, I think, uh, mitigate against uh, bringing women back to the ordained diaconate in, in which they served, you know, for a about a thousand years uh, uh, as ordained clerics. I mean, there's, there's all sorts of uh, documentation, um, direct and indirect, that women were considered as part of the clerical caste. So, I mean, who's, a, you know, ask, ask, ask the guy down the block what he thinks of it and, you know, 50-50 chance that he'll be threatened. So. <clears throat> um. Marina Knox asks, is this a compromise because women are not allowed to be priests? Well, I don't know. We'll ask Deacon, uh, Deacon Jim here. Uh, is your being a deacon a compromise because you're married and you can't be a priest? I would say, and my understanding is from other directors of deacon programs, that if a fella uh, approaches the diaconal uh, formation, the formator, and says he wants to be a deacon because he can't be a priest, um, he's shown the door. Because these are distinct vocations. Uh, the vocation of the diaconate is not the vocation to the priesthood. The diaconate is not the priesthood. The deacon is uh, the minister of the word, of the liturgy, and charity. Um, the, 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 the deacon... The deacon, I, I like it better in Nomine, Ecclesi in Nomine Ecclesiae, that the deacon serves in the name of the church, that the, is, the deacon is the church ministering to the church. If you think of the deacon at mass, the deacon is the one, it's kind of an odd way to say it, between the priest and the people. I mean, in, in Orthodox liturgy, actually, in Eastern liturgy, that's actually what happens. But, but the deacon is the one who... Um, um, who speaks to the people, speaks directly to the people. The deacon ministers the, uh, the, the precious blood. The, the deacon um, proclaims the gospel. When, when in terms of um, it being a settlement, you know, because women can't be priests, well, it's never been my research. Um, and it's not something that, that, that I, I know nothing about a history of women in in priesthood. I, I do know a lot about the history of women in the diaconate. Uh, people say, uh, oh, women deacons and women, women uh, and men deacons didn't do the same things. Well, you know, you're right. Uh, women deacons did a lot more than men deacons. Uh, women, women deacons anointed, women deacons visited the sick, um, as I said earlier. So um, <clears throat> I think we, we, um, we have a, 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 a I, I, I'm just looking at one of my books here and I'll show it to you in a second. The, um, I was seated at dinner in Casa Santa Marta and the whole commission was there. There were 14 people, uh, one across, big long table. And the fellow across from me was a priest from the uh, Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith. And I said, well, why can't women be ordained as deacons? He said, because women can't image Christ. And I said, uh, watch me. So I wrote a book. And it's called Women Icons of Christ. I think that's the bottom of the story, the bottom, the bottom line here in terms of um, in, in terms of the entire argument, really, 
but as I said, I don't get involved with the priesthood argument, but they can't, they, they're stuck with a naive physicalism that the deacon is in persona Christi Servi in the person of Christ the servant. And somehow that's all mixed up with in persona Christi Capitus Ecclesiae in the person of Christ, the head of the church, who is the priest. And there is a theology that the, the priest stands in the person in the place of Christ in the sac sacrifice of the mass. Um, I, I don't see it as settling. Um, and I've never thought of it that way. Um, but maybe because many women experience a vocation to priesthood, um, they might see that, uh, you know. Um, and well, anything's up for grabs, you know, Sister, Sister Pat asked, get a group together, get a group together and talk about that, but pray about it. It's more important, it's encounter, it's listen and discern. You know, as I said in the talk, I, I, I kind of chuckled that I think the Holy Father is bringing us all on a two year Ignatian retreat because it's really about discernment here. Uh, it's really about praying. It's really about listening to the Holy Spirit acting in the world, acting in history, acting in the world, acting in the people we meet, acting in the needs and hopes and dreams of all of us. And we have the opportunity to, um, you know, the way it's described, I don't know if you ever had uh, brainstorming described, but it, to me, it's almost like brainstorming. You, you, you're not gonna respond, you're just gonna listen. You know, listen to the ideas of the other person. How does the other person see and the other persons in your group see? So anyway. Talking too much here. <laughs> well, and, and another question just popped up, so it's 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 good. Um, <laughs> I was going to respond a little bit, but I'll do that after. <laughs> it seems uh, darkly ironic that there were ordained women deacons in medieval times, but not in our enlightened modern society. Um, they're, they didn't put the quotes I did, but anyway. Um, were there any historical theological developments that served as an impetus to attack this type of ministry around the 12th century? Why were women accepted before that time? Paternalism and negative stereotypes of women presumably existed before. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it grew. And as I said, I referenced the ninth century Council of Paris. Uh, it's interesting that the female diaconate lasted as a permanent vocation longer than the male diaconate. Um, by the time of Gresham, uh, around 11th, 12th century, uh, the thing called the cursus honorum had become law. And no one was allowed to be ordained a deacon unless he had gone through the whole cursus honorum. What is that? Well, the cursus honorum is tonsure, lector, porter, exorcist, uh, acolyte and subdeacon, deacon, priest. You couldn't be ordained as a deacon unless you could be ordained as a priest. So why that happened? Well, the priests, basically the priests of Rome, but the priests were a little bit jealous of the deacons. You know, we have 37 popes who were never priests. Um, 30, 30, 37 popes who were elected as deacons, 36 of whom were never priested. Uh, the 37th, uh, Gregorio Sette, Gregory the Seventh, uh, insisted on being made a priest before he became a deacon, but that's not until the 10th, 11th century. Um, excuse me, insisted on, insist on becoming a priest before he became a, a bishop. Um, <clears throat> however, as the priests of Rome and elsewhere kind of got rid of the diaconate, bishops still needed women deacons for ministry. Um, and secondly, uh, women deacons still had a, a, a role in monastic life, more in the East, uh, Eastern churches than in the West, but they still had a role. We know about a lot of it in, in, in Italy. You know, at one time there were 500 um, uh, Eastern monasteries in Italy. Now there are two left. Uh, but the, uh, particularly in Sicily, for example, uh, it began very early in, in um, in the uh, sixth century, I think uh, Pope Gelasius the uh, first wrote a, an article or wrote a letter complaining that women were at the altar doing the same thing men did. You know that women deacons were mixing the water and the wine, um, and these were clearly um, clearly Eastern uh, right women deacons, uh, Greek Greek women deacons at the time. Um, 
But in any event, the, the female diaconate was shoved into monasteries. So uh, it, it, was, it, wasn't, um, <clears throat> it wasn't a public discussion really. It was more that the female diaconate uh, kind of became less and less necessary, uh, if that's the way I could put it. Um, but you see remnants of it every place. I remember being in Ireland at the uh, Cistercian, uh, Cistercian Abbey of St. Mary in, uh, um, what county are they in? County Wexford, County Waterford, County. Uh, and and um, at the end of Vespers, the, the abbess uh, blessed the sisters. The abbess has a crozier. She showed me her ring. You know, um, so there's all this, this mixed up uh, history here. Uh, but many times we have uh, a battle deacons, abbess deacons, um, well into the 12th century. And we know for a fact that Bishop Otoni uh, in Luca ordained women as deacons, possibly to be what they call social service deacons, or the kind of deacons we think of today out and about. Um, because there's always the impetus and the need uh, for ministry, and specifically the ministry of women to women, I would say it's not so much uh, growing either ignorance or disparagement of women uh, as we go through the Middle Ages. I think it's more a question of safety um, about having women out uh, ministering. And now, you know, it, I mean, I go on forever about this, but when you, you move through the, uh, the Middle Ages, you find uh, other ministerial works of women not necessarily connected directly to clerical orders uh, and not really uh, necessarily connected to monasteries, but creating a new kind of thing like the Mantigliate in the, in the time of Catherine of Siena, um, who uh, clearly ministered to the people, diacon made, did diaconal ministry in Siena uh, during the bubonic plague in the, in the 14th century. Uh, burying the dead, you know, feeding the, the, the hungry and the poor and the ill. And uh, not, not incidentally, uh, as one might say, preaching and uh, helping uh, the Pope get back from Avignon. She actually wanted to cut her hair and put on a Dominican friar's habit um, and go about preaching um, in, in the neighborhood. So anyway, that's kind of a digression there, excuse me. <laughs> Just... um... Oh, look at her. Yeah, my good friend Ann Walsh from out in Newfoundland says, Phyllis, I think that your encouragement to gather people to li learn, listen, share, and discuss is freeing and helpful in light of the Synod. What other suggestions might you have with regard to how to further this discussion of the diaconate for women and move it forward? Well, there are a couple of things. <clears throat> The Holy Father wants us to encounter each other, to listen, and to pray. There's a group called Discerning Deacons, which you can find on, on the website, that is actually running conversations about the diaconate. Uh, I think they're doing it all electronically. <clears throat> um, there are books. I mean, all of my, I think all of my books have study guides uh, for free download on, on the website and a group called Voice of the Faithful in the United States, I know ran, ran groups during the heavy part of the pandemic last year, <clears throat> ran, ran something, something like eight or 12 uh, uh, different groups of, of people on Zoom, uh, talking about one of the books that I showed, Women, um, Women Deacons, uh, Past, Present, Future, which is also in Spanish and in that's yeah, that's Spanish, and I don't have the French, but there was a picture of it, uh, and in uh, Portuguese, and there are study guides for all of these. So I mean, to begin with, the easy thing would be to just uh, you can get the books online or used, or or even if you want, you can buy them new. Um, <clears throat> but uh, you can download the study guides for free and have a group. You know, it doesn't matter if it's four or forty in your in your group. Um, to just pray. And, and the, to, the study guides for, the, for this book, Women, Deacons, Past, Present, Future, which I co-wrote with uh, Gary Macy, who's an historian, and Bill Deitwig, who is a, a deacon and an expert in Vatican II and, uh, and the diaconate. Um, the study guides are very interesting uh, in the way that they were written uh, because they include sections for prayer, uh, to gather people, to have gathering prayers, a little song, and, and questions, uh, and, and it's really a, you know, 
mimics, if, if you will, or at least replicates the, the, the uh, synodal process. It's encounter, listen, and discern. Encounter each other, listen to each other, but listen to the Holy Spirit. Um, um, and, and, and how does, how are we, how does Jesus speak to us in scripture? How does God speak to us in, in scripture? And how do we discern? Um, discernment is, <clears throat> discernment is not a political discussion. Uh, it's not, it's not an academic argument. I can make academic arguments from here to Hackensack, but, <clears throat> but to actually, um, take and pray about the needs of the church. That to me is what's encouraging about the synodal process. It's not about whether we have women deacons, it's not about whether we have women cardinals, it's not about whether we have married priests, it's not about any of these things. <clears throat> what it is about is the needs of the people of God, the needs of the, the poor, the needs of the rich, okay? The needs of the uneducated and the needs of the educated. Um, it, it's about all of our needs as we kind of slog through left foot, right foot, um, through through this beautiful life that we have and how we can help others uh, live live their lives, how we can help and minister and be present and be other Christs to to serve and be in the in, in the image in the image of Christ. Um, you don't need to be ordained uh, to to image Christ to someone else. You may be the only Christ they see. <coughs> um. And it's just mentioning that thank you to self I'm on the, the team coordinating the synod process for Archdiocese of St. John's. And this is helping to open up other avenues of discernment and collecting the concerns and hopes of God's people in this process. <coughs> All right. Thank you. Um, <coughs> I'm listening to your voice and I'm not seeing more questions. I'm thinking it might be a good <laughs> place. No, I'm fine. I'll go on. I just, I, I, I just, uh... Okay. Um, well, I'm, I'm maybe just, um, I'm just trying to, I, I wanted to um, respond a little bit earlier to your, your question about the, uh, uh, that difference in call. I, I think it's, it is important that I think very, I, I, people, other people who know me know that I, I've been involved in the formation of deacons for a number of years now. But that's a, a call, a, a question that I know I had to personally answer as I was once in formation for the priesthood, right? And, uh, and I think it is a different call. Um, and if we have someone who comes in and, and thinks of the diaconate as a consolation prize, I had a wise spiritual director who said to me, if, if your call is to the priesthood, but you can't pursue that because you're married, as, as it were, right? Um, the diaconate is not going to satisfy Right, it won't won't feed that that call, and uh, and so it's important. And, and I think that uh, when we talk about discernment, we're talking about trying to discern from what's possible, right? What's what's here? What's here right in front of us right now? And and uh, so I'm encouraged by your 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 words. I, I hope I'm encouraged. <laughs> That's your intention in saying that, but it's important to think about vocation as opposed to default or position. Right? What am I called to here? The, the the pain that I hear from people is that I can't do that. So I'm I'm I feel that call, I feel that stirring, but I can't um, attain that. I can't go there because I, I'm not allowed. Right? And that's the pain I think that I hear of uh, from women right now. But it, I mean, I do hear it from married men and the priesthood as well. Um, but it's uh, it's. Yeah, how do we open up that? How do we open well, up the, the, the point if I'm if the point, if I may, is is one of vocation. Uh, and that kind of uh, returns me to the vocation of the religious. Uh, if one is called to religious community um, <clears throat> and ministers as a lay woman or lay religious, that there's no reason for her to feel that she needs to be a deacon if she doesn't have that vocation. But when I talk to women religious around the world who are in positions uh, running parishes, basically, where it really would be helpful if they were ordained as deacons and helpful to the bishops as well, uh, mm -hmm. because uh, if you're out there in the hinterlands, uh, 
it's difficult to get uh, uh, permission every for every wedding, permission for every uh, every uh, baptism. Now I know you can get rescripts if you're the bishop. You can get a rescript to allow lay people to uh, either on a case by case, actually on a case by case basis, to perform weddings and baptisms. Uh, but you, when you're deep in the Amazon, I'm sorry that the you know the FedEx doesn't get there, and you're not going to get the letter uh, saying it's okay to baptize. And and so many stories I've heard in Alaska, for example, when the plane couldn't get there. Um, they, they, you know, and the wedding was set, um, even in my own um, area here, uh, a poor Spanish parish not far from me, the whole family was there for the baptism, everybody was all dressed up and the Spanish priest didn't show up. So the sister actually who was was managing the, the ceremony, she just did it. Um, and she did not have permission. Uh, to do it, but she did it. And, and she told me a very funny story. She said she, of course, called the local vicar to say what, what she did. And he, and he said, what'd you do? She said, well, I baptized the child. I mean, the family was there, everybody, you know, it was all set and it was terrible. I didn't want to send them away. <clears throat> he, she said, well, what exactly do you? Well, you know, I, I poured the water and used the salt and the, and, and he said, I, I think you're breaking up here. <laughs> I, I can't quite hear you. <laughs> uh, and she signed the register. And it's, you know, the, the, the difference in the joke I'm making that Jim gets is, and some of you others, uh, uh, she performed a solemn baptism. Not a simple baptism, which anybody can perform in the, in the delivery room. The nurse can baptize the baby, uh, but, uh, <clears throat> or in a, a problem marriage, the mother, one of my cousins actually, a mother can take the child oh. upstairs and baptize him. But uh, we, uh, uh, I, I think we, uh, and I've talked to bishops and simply said, you know, would you rather have a lay person running a parish alone or would you rather have a deacon? And, and it's very simple, I'd rather have a deacon. Um, to have a, a woman or a man deacon, I don't think in, 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 <clears throat> in times of need, um, it makes a difference. Uh, so it depends on the circumstance. It depends on, on where the location. Um, it depends, uh, but it really depends on the needs of the church. And if the needs of the church include the needs of women and the needs of women include ministry to women, um, even without restoring uh, to women deacons, because men deacons don't have this authority, um, the ability to, um, to, uh, to anoint uh, Ill, Ill women. Even without that, um, <clears throat> I think I think there would be a distinct difference um, in increasing the numbers of women who uh, present the face of the church to the people of God. Um, you know, because the the cleric who is known in a parish is assumed to be approachable, is assumed to be helpful, uh, is assumed to be um, be able to uh, maintain secrecy. Um, and silence about people's difficulties, and uh, um, which is not to decry lay ministry at all. I mean, there are many wonderfully uh, uh, wonderful lay ministers. But the other part of it, I think, is the symbolic thing that, that to have a woman, I say this all the time, and I, I've said this in Rome at table with cardinals, um, until a woman is standing uh, in St. Peter's next to the Holy Father proclaiming the gospel, um, you have no right really to say that women are equal, uh, not the same, but women are equal to men. Women are equally made in the image and likeness of God. You have no right to say that. And, and until that happens, I'm gonna continue to blame you for um, female genital mutilation. I'm gonna continue to blame you for rapes um, and, and wife beating and for dowry burnings and for all the horrendous things, um, the ways in which women are treated around the world because the, the Catholic Church is the largest religious body in the world uh, or organization, 1.2 billion people. Uh, we have 2 billion Christians. And the, the, but the Catholic Church uh, does not say, uh, will not say, or has not said in, in the past 800 years that women can be ordained. And as I said earlier, it was astonishing to me to have an official of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith tell me that women couldn't image Christ. 
Uh, I mean, that's heretical. Uh, and, and so unless we, um, until that happens, uh, I, I think the church will continue to lose its credibility um, as a, uh, a teacher uh, of, of, of the gospel, as, as a bringer of the good news of Jesus Christ, uh, because that's all it's about. Um, uh, it's, it's not about who gets to dress up on Sundays and march around the altar. <clears throat> um, somebody made a comment about me. Uh, oh, well, she wants to do his prance about the altar. I said, well, yeah, <clears throat> I can do it. And I can do it backwards in high heels, you know? So uh, I think that the, the, uh, uh, the, there's a lot of anger out there. And I think that's something we have to listen to. Um, and understand um, where the anger is, as they say, coming from. Uh, the clericalism <clears throat> is, uh, creates anger. Um, the sex abuse business creates anger. Uh, and I, I really think about that seriously. I, I think it's all been conflated into, into like one gelatinous mix of uh, anti-Catholicism, uh, which is infecting our church and our churches, uh, and, and until we, um, we straighten that out, and I think the synodal process is the way to do it. And as I said earlier, I think it's, it's kind of interesting uh, that we have a Jesuit pro really bring us through a, a two year, 30 day retreat uh, uh, to, to really understand, uh, encounter, listen, discern, that's beautiful, uh, just beautiful. Anyway, do we have more questions? I, I... Well, I, I think there were more comments, but um, I think it's probably a good place to, you know, this is what the, you know, so there's that question of what am I called to, but also what is the church called to? And I think that's what you're getting at here in terms of the, the synodal process, that it's really that, that calling forth of, you know, listening. It's listening to what, what are we meant to be, right? So not just where are we, but what are we, what are we meant to be? Yeah. Okay, well, I think that I'm going to uh, just say a word of thanks. I, I think what you've done for me here tonight, um, and so I just I, I have to speak on behalf of everybody, but thank you so much. Uh, I think a very complete presentation, but I, I really appreciated the way that you situated it within the synodal process, uh, because I think that's really the point, is that if we do listen to our history, right? And I, I think that what you, the last point you just made about this gelatinous mass of everything gets conflated into anti-Catholicism. I think we experience that in school as well, in, in the university context. And, uh, and so it doesn't always uh, sit well. But I, I think that um, what, I, what I learned from you tonight was that importance of stepping back to appreciate where we've been, but also to prayerfully consider where we ought to be and where we could be and what we, what we could be as a community if we uh, listen first to those voices that have been uh, systemically silenced. Um, and that applies to so many things. So I, I appreciate it. it's taken us about two or three years to get you here. <laughs> I know we started working at it, and uh, but I'm so appreciative that we were able to make this happen, uh, even though it's on Zoom. Um, so just on, on behalf of, of everyone here, just a, a word of thanks. So thank, thank you, you so much for being with us. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Um, so just uh, before I let everybody go here, um, just a, a quick word. Uh, well, thanks to all of you for making the time and, and coming. In uh, four weeks' time, uh, we'll be welcoming Father Dennis Holtschneider, um, who, uh, God willing, uh, will offer a live uh, <laughs> uh, lecture, um, at least for, for some people. So keep an eye out for how we're going to manage that, because I think we're, we're at this point allowed to have about 50 people in the uh, auditorium uh, distanced. Um, but uh, so Father Dennis will be talking, will be helping us have a closer look at the Catholic intellectual tradition and what that means for universities today. So uh, please uh, plan to join us and uh, continue the conversation. We'll continue to listen together. So once again, thank you. Be safe, be good to each other and uh, keep well. All right, good night. Thanks so much, Melissa. Thank you. Bye-bye.